right, guys. JJ. Pardon. <laughs> Sorry, pardon. We're just going to wait for Claire. Um, Okay. Please just tell us, Maria. Okay, thanks. And then I'm ready to go live with mic number one. Sure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the program is just about to start. Could you please take your seats? Thank you. Hello. Right. Good morning, everyone. It's buzzing, it's buzzing, it's buzzing. That's a good sign. Good morning, everybody. We're ready to start. Buenos dias. How is everyone? Oh, we can do better than that. How is everybody? Hey, bravo. That's what I want to hear. So, it's day two and most of us are over our jet lags, hopefully. Um, I know I am still struggling with it, as some of you might be, but my name's Pat Dwyer, and I am from The Purpose Business, a consultancy based in London that works with listed companies or small uh, startup companies and NGOs on building their sustainability strategies out. And part of the work that we do has to do with things like waste management, food waste management, and then food banking becomes a part of it as well. But I am very privileged to have a back-to-back -back double act this morning. No pressure on that. Um, so this is two panels that are squeezed within over the next couple of hours, which we hope will not feel like a couple of hours, because we are going to do things slightly differently today. Starting with a poll. So you're going to see on the screen a poll. And we're doing this for the first time. So let's all have a bit of fun. If I can have you going to live.voxvote.com, this is the one time you can actually be on your mobile phones, and, uh, and it's OK. So please go on the website, live.voxvote.com. And what we're going to do is get a pulse of how you're feeling about this question. So as soon as you get on the site, um, if we try and get on it, let's see. Are you guys trying to do this too? No. <laughs> My panelists are well behaved. They don't have their mobile phones up here. We do. <laughs> are we in? Yes. OK. Very good. So now it's starting. If you pop in pin number 69976, you should see the question. And you can just pick an answer and click Submit. Very good. Thank you for the first answer. Let's try and get all 200 of you up there. Very interesting. <coughs> I feel like we should be having music at the moment, but <laughs> right. So just one answer, please. I think we have a clear winner so far, but wow. there could be about 60 of you who could vote completely differently. So let's wait a bit. All right. What's that looking like? That's more than half. We'll just finish the time on this one. technology then it's part of it. Yeah? There's a clear winner. I mean <coughs> thirty seconds to go to change the winner. How's that? It's not oh not there yet. Okay. Cool. 
So whilst you're voting, for some of you who are done, um, we're going to do this once. There's a poll now, and there's also a poll later on for the second panel. So it's just a great way to get you engaged. Um, this session is going to be very interactive. What we're going to try and do is just have a conversation with the panel and then bring you into that conversation as well. So over the next 25 minutes, 30 minutes, we'll have a chat, but we'll also open it up to questions because we feel like we're no experts. This is a conversation between the audience and the panel itself. Right, 55.1% technology in the food system. Technology should serve our purpose. It should help us do food banking much better, and we'll hear more about that today. So just a few things as well. We'll kick the panel off now, but what we're going to do is have this poll, have the panel do the Q&A. There's also a bit of a video that we're going to show in between just to transition the first panel to the second one. We'll do another poll, and then we'll kick off with a final panel. Right, so that's how we're going to run today's session. And it is such a pleasure to have um, three experts on the side of supply chain um, that I could be with today. And I'd really like to make sure that we talk about the emerging trends on the side of <coughs> supply chain. Um, I am very, very blessed to have Facundo Echebehere from Danone. Um, really interesting title you have there. Global Public Affairs Director and Head of Corporate Affairs, Essential Dairy and Plant-Based Danone in France. I don't think we had that title <laughs> two or three years ago, so you win Best Title Award. Um, we also have Maria Jose Mejia Lara, Resource Generation and Alliances Manager from Exito, all the way from Colombia. Um, and JJ Freo, Global Head of Sustainability for Bambles. But I also heard that you head global affairs as well. Recently, yes. Yes, so not an easy job, but we hope to hear more about that. I just got the position during Brexit, which is a pleasure. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Something good comes out of it, hey? All right. Well, great, so let's kick it off. In this session, I feel, when I started to chat with the panelists, there was a lot of talk about collaboration and how really collaboration is key <coughs> in the supply chain. So, Facundo, when we first talked, you said you're coming to this conference with the spirit of wanting to foster even more partnerships and collaboration. But a lot of us know that, we heard as well from Dave yesterday, that giving up trust is not an easy thing. Collaborating means you know, you changed some of the traditional ways that you've been running your business. And so Danone has had collaboration at the heart of the business. How do you get that done? Well, thanks for the invitation. I am very happy to be here. Buenos dias. I will speak in English just to simplify the translation. Uh, in fact, what our relationship with the food banks is not about donations. It's about understanding how to do it better. It's about collaboration. It's about improving the way we do things. And that's the reason why we have been collaborating with food banks in several countries in local basis. So there is no one relationship. We have several relationships with the food banks. And each time we discuss about collaboration with a food bank, it's locally relevant. So it's linked to our local team's connection with local people at local level in the food banks. And that is totally important, totally different. When we discuss at global level, we are not adding what is happening at local level. The figures are there. We can consolidate figures. But collaboration is meaningful only when we have people around and collaborating for something that is relevant for all, is purpose driven, is meaningful for all of us. So unleashing the power of uh, this new value chain is essentially linked to collaboration. And when we talk about the value chain, we are not talking about cost and how the split is the cost within this value chain. We are talking about a value chain to create value. And we were discussing with, with some colleagues from Argentina yesterday. And, and in fact, we, would, we were saying that what we are doing is trying to, to bring more social impact in a new way. So it's about that. It's about collaboration to make things happen, to impact where matters. So that's collaboration from my perspective. So it's not one answer mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, who should be in the value chain, in which way. Yeah. It's about the mindset. Yes. It's about unleashing the power of this new <coughs> social value creation uh, chain. 
how does it work? Do you vet? There's so many food banks that you work with. And to vet them, to give them the, the credibility to assure so that they can stand and have the credibility to assure you know, the end receivers of all the goods. How do you do that? How does it, is it policies? Is it guidelines? Yes, we have a common ambition that is to reduce food waste. I, I love this edible surplus approach that is better, is more positive. We want to save that food. So to do that, we need to, to understand where it's happening. So when we have a commercial relationship, uh, it's different the type of relationship we have in one country than the other. It depends on the type of retail. Uh, customers are big or small. So we need to acknowledge that different, those differences, but also we need to learn from what is uh, the insight that the food banks are bringing to us. Mm -hmm. So first, a key uh, suggestion we, we give to our market is to be open to dialogue with the food banks. Many times we are learning from the food banks what could be done at local level because uh, the food banks are understanding what are the opportunities. So openness is a global rule for us. And, and also, for us, as a global rule, a policy is fostering collaboration, as I was mentioning before, because it's obviously impossible to do this without collaboration in a value chain. And, and also, we, we are part of an institution that is the Consumer Good Forum, yeah. uh, where we participate, uh, the, the industry, manufacturers, consumer goods, and customers, all the retailers. It's a global platform, many of you may know it, uh, that is really fostering this collaboration in a structured way. So we have a global commitment through this institution, but also uh, we are uh, opening opportunities through dialogue within this platform to identify where, in which country, we can do something together. And that is also together, meaning with the food banks. It really helps to have a forum that facilitates it. You know, the, yesterday we heard a little bit of it already, but to have a conduit that brings in the small food banks and then becomes a partner, a collaborator in the middle, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, when we talk about uh, yogurts, we need to have the right uh, cold chain. And, and this is in, about <coughs> investment. It's about uh, renting the right facilities. So it's, it's articulating the efforts. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's the donation, but also understanding what are the, the roadblocks there, what are the elements that we need to put in place yeah. to unleash the, the, the donation to reach the final destination in a proper way to save that food. Mm, right. So uh, at the end, it's, 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 it's all about listening. Yes. It's about having the right conversation with the right people, identifying what are the elements that could help us to, to succeed uh, saving food, but also reaching the people that is needing this uh, to, be, to be served. I think that's a very powerful message. And I also just want to acknowledge Claire, who comes in from RAP. Um, you're coming in at the right time, so I'm going to put you on the spot. A um, little bit of a penalty for, uh, for um, well, at least joining us. I, I'm glad you can be here today. So we've just been talking about greater collaboration, and I know that you are at the heart of mechanisms that foster greater collaboration. And we've mentioned voluntary agreements roughly, but I think for the audience today, that is one tool that should really be able to, to kind of put a structure in place as to what Facundo was saying. So can you shed a bit more light on what are voluntary agreements, Claire? Yes. Um, so apologies for my tardiness. <coughs> You'd think as a native I would kind of anticipate that on the day you have to be here early, everything goes wrong on your journey. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened. Um, We're busy collaborating. <laughs> to prevent me from being here. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, I work for an organisation called RAP, we're an NGO uh, and a charity based in the UK, um, and one of the things that we are known for is um, the projects that we do around voluntary agreements. So um, a voluntary agreement, as, as the name implies, is a voluntary mechanism by which um, people, f actors from the public sector and the private sector, and along the whole retail chain can kind of come together. Um, but one of the ways that I like to explain it is to tell a little story about one of the, just one of the projects that we've done in it. Um, so a retailer, one of the main retailers here in the UK that we worked with, um, they called us up and they said, we're having this huge problem uh, with potatoes in our store. Like so many of them are getting damaged. We're having to throw them away. We can't even donate them. Can you come and help us? And so... 
a consultancy would generally go in and say, okay, well, let's look at how you're handling the potatoes, let's look at your storage infrastructure, etc. Um, but the way that the voluntary agreement works is to take what I call the annoying toddler approach, and anyone who has or has had a toddler will know what I mean when I say it's just about asking why over and over and over again. So we went in and we said, why are these potatoes getting damaged? Oh, you know, because they don't get handled very well, blah, 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 but, but why? And um, it transpired that what was happening is that the farmer who was growing those potatoes was growing a very particular variety because the size specification from the retailer was for a 45 millimeter potato. And when we said, why is it 45 millimeters? Everyone around the table said, I don't know. Nobody knew. At some point, somewhere, somebody had written 45 millimetres on, on a piece of paper, and that was it. That was the minimum size of acceptable potato for this retailer. And we said, what if it was 43? And they said, oh, no. You know, our customers will never go for that. We said, well, why don't we try it in a few stores? Now, I don't know about you, but I cannot tell the difference between a 43 millimetre potato and a 45 millimetre potato and neither can most people. And so we said, okay, well, what if we relax that size specification? And so we went back to the farmer and we're kind of around the table and we said, okay, what would you do differently if the size specification was relaxed? He was like, oh, well, I'd grow this other variety instead. So we're like, okay, well, we'll relax that specification. He was able to change the variety of potato that he was growing to one that instead of being kind of focused towards big potatoes, it was about the overall yield and consistency. What it also meant was that variety was more resistant to disease, it had a lower water requirement, and it was much easier to handle. And so by bringing all of that together, he was able to be way more profitable, 6,000 pounds per hectare, which if you come from a farming background, you will know that's a lot of money. Um, and we fixed the problem in the back of store with the potatoes getting damaged. And that's the power of the voluntary agreement of bringing together the supply chain, bringing together organizations who traditionally would have a combative relationship um, into what we call a pre-competitive collaborative space. And so that's kind of an example of, of how they work. That's amazing. I think it's really forcing the hand on change, and that's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, I will want to come back to some more examples, I guess, because a lot of us are here to learn how can we take a voluntary agreement and apply that. But if we can put our headsets on, I'd like to um, address the next question to, to um, Maria, because we want to hear the voice of the food banks as well. So now you've heard you know, Danone as a as a major company trying to foster collaboration, there's mechanisms like voluntary agreements that can be put in place. But what's it like to be in the food bank distributing and dispersing it? So, Maria, if I can ask you, um, you've been on the food banking side quite a long time, and with Exito, you're, you're going to share some examples of the programs that have really worked. I know you're coming more from the experience in Colombia, but we all know that you know, it's in Brazil, it's in Uruguay, so we really want to learn from you. So can you share a little bit of the programs that you have in terms of collaboration? Muy buenos días para todos. Eh, yo trabajo en el Grupo Éxito. El Grupo Éxito es un retail que es eh, del Grupo Casino. Nosotros tenemos en este momento en Brasil, en Uruguay, en Argentina y en Colombia operación con más de 1.500 tiendas, pero trabajamos de manera independiente en Colombia. Yo trabajo para la Fundación Éxito, que es del Grupo Éxito. Nosotros trabajamos por la alimentación de los niños menores de 5 años, por el tema de desnutrición crónica, con una estrategia llamada Gen Cero, generación al 2030, con cero de nutrición crónica. Y hemos ayudado a los bancos de alimentos por más de 20 años. Nosotros hace aproximadamente 5 años, en compañía del Banco de Alimentos Saciar, empezamos un proyecto que se llama Reagro. Reagro es la recuperación de excedentes agrícolas. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Vamos al campo y le decimos al campesino, que el producto que no pudo eh, vender 
por X motivo, porque sembró mucho, porque la oferta es muy alta. Ese producto lo que hacemos es que el Banco de Alimentos va y se lo pide al agricultor, ¿sí? Y el agricultor lo que hace es que le dice al banco que se lo entregue a las personas más vulnerables, ¿cierto? Para darles un poco de números, en la Fundación Éxito, en el Grupo Éxito, recogemos en 570 tiendas de retail cerca de 1.900 toneladas de alimentos en el 2018. Pero con Reagro, solamente en un departamento que es Antioquia, con la Fundación Saciar, recogimos más de 3.400 toneladas de alimentos. Entonces, cuando vemos este número tan impresionante, tomamos una decisión en el 2017 y fue con la ayuda del Banco de Alimentos Saciar masificar la experiencia en los demás bancos de alimentos. Y fuimos los propulsores y los cofinanciadores de un taller muy interesante, que más tarde les van a hablar de esto, es el taller Reagro, en donde lo que hicimos fue enseñarles a trabajar con Reagro a los 17 bancos de alimentos restantes en Colombia. Para darles números, logramos aumentar 900 toneladas a finales del 2018. Creo que el número interesante lo vamos a lograr ver en el 2019 porque sentimos que con la inteligencia que están teniendo las tiendas al comprar a los negociadores cuando hablan con los proveedores y definen volver más inteligente ese proceso de compra, entonces los productos van a escasearse en las tiendas. ¿Qué estamos haciendo nosotros como retailers para decirle a los bancos de alimentos, venga que nosotros lo acompañamos a buscar estrategias que permitan que su banco de alimentos pueda tener un poco más de alimentos y que lo recupere en donde sí encuentra primero un producto de primera eh, porque es un producto que acaba de salir del campo, independiente de las condiciones como tú lo decías, y eh, no solamente eso, sino en grandes cantidades. Eso de parte como externo, de parte interna, de manera permanente, lo que estamos haciendo en el retail es revisar la cadena de abastecimiento, es lograr sensibilizar a las personas que trabajan con nosotros para que entiendan que hay muchísimas personas vulnerables en el mundo y que Colombia es un país con alta inequidad, entonces necesitamos de alguna manera apoyarlos y qué otra herramienta que el Banco de Alimentos. Entonces lo que hacemos es trabajar con la cadena logística, lo segundo es disminuir los espacios que tenemos en nuestros centros de distribución, haciendo que los proveedores entreguen su producto en los bancos y trabajando proyectos de logística en reversa. Adicional, hemos encontrado en las aplicaciones móviles digamos una herramienta fundamental para poder eh, darle una buena comunicación al banco de alimentos y a las personas del retail para que cuando afinemos esa comunicación se pueda entregar más productos con menos vencimiento y además pues lo que logramos no solamente es darle más producto al banco de alimentos sino también que las personas del retail entiendan la importancia de su labor independiente del espacio que ocupen en la cadena de la tienda. That's really powerful. Uh, thank you for that because I think when we say that we're in the business of reducing food waste, you know, we heard from yesterday and then again, I'm sure we'll hear today that companies and retailers can really be very efficient to a certain level. We accept that there's always going to be surplus, right? And the food banks can't be beholden to this, but you know, you complemented the idea that Claire was just talking about. If you can empower and change specifications that we've written for whatever reason, and then now you can have a smart process that bridges and empowers food banks to go straight to the farming communities. So that dialogue is unheard of, and in a way we're changing the supply chain there. Um, you said this is starting in 2019. We look forward to hearing the results, I guess, um, within the year, if not next year. But I also want to look at um, some other examples that you're working on, and we can circle back a little bit later on. But you mentioned that you work with the logistics channels, and we're blessed to have um, JJ in the panel as well. And maybe, JJ, just for the others who might not know Brambles by the name, and they know Brambles by the experience of it. So tell us a little bit about how the logistics role or the role of that industry in food banking, but also in kind of making this food system more efficient. So again, um, thank you for, for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel a bit like at home and that's great. I've been, in, you know, I'm from a company called Brambles. I'm sure you don't know what Brambles is, but if I tell you that, that one of the companies that Brambles uh, 
owns is Chep, the blue palettes. Probably you will know. Everyone is nodding now, and I love that <laughs> because actually we've been collaborating with food banks all around the globe for years. We are collaborating with hundreds of, of food banks. And um, for me, it's interesting to share our experience with you because, um, I mean, I think very properly, I'm sitting here between the manufacturer and the retailer just by chance because that's who we are. You know, we are a logistics company that facilitates this flow and hopefully that flow to the, to the audience uh, as, uh, as well. I, um, for us, the collaboration with food, food banks has been an extremely, extremely, I need to highlight, positive uh, program. And, and the reason for that, and, and Lisa, I, I always quote this sentence from you, hopefully it is from you because I'm quoting it all the time, that the, the food, um, uh, uh, food waste is not a supply, or, or, or the hunger, or, or food banks, they don't deal with a supply problem, it is with a supply chain problem. And this is where we can uh, make a difference. We started with this program some years ago, and um, the reason is when I took care of the sustainability program in Brambas, we were doing many different things in the social uh, aspect. You name it, we were doing there. But for me, there is this concept of materiality. If you put together a good sustainability program, you need to see where you can have the largest, the biggest impact. And, uh, and we saw that the collaboration with food banks offered us uh, the opportunity to make a huge impact. I, I, I hope uh, this, is, this is the case. And we have structured our collaboration in, in different aspects. I, the, the typical thing that, that probably every company does is the volunteering, and this is now part of our culture. Thousands, literally thousands of our people go to food banks. I go there every year to the food bank in Madrid, so if the Madrid food bank is there probably you have uh, here, you probably you have seen me around, and to actually help with our hands doing there, doing, moving things, moving stuff. You, you know that because uh, you have many of, of, of us um, doing that. Then the second part is the donations, and in our case, donations is a bit different because it is not food donations. What, what, apart from the financial donations, and anyone can do that, it is the donations of our equipment. No? And what we do as a company is to provide pallets, to provide crates, to, prov to provide containers to move the food. No? And we do it in a, in a sustainable way. We are part of the circular economy, so once it is used, we recover and we make sure that it is used and used again. So on one hand, we donate the use of those pallets that are needed. We, we call ourselves the invisible backbone of the supply chain, so we help moving things, as I said. But also this has been a win-win situation for us. I mean, as part of our culture and as part of our business, we don't want to lose our packaging. We need to recover it back, you know, because we need to, to give it to another one so it is reused again. So this collaboration has been very fruitful uh, because, first of all, we donate the, the use of the equipment and then we can recover the equipment so it is uh, reused again. And the third part, the third block of our collaboration that I think is the most exciting one and we, really where our employees get the most excited is this um, logistics expertise. For good or bad, we are expert in logistics. And we know how to manage uh, transportation, we know how to design a warehouse, we know how to implement a safety policy in, uh, in, in a warehouse or in the activities. And this is something that we are doing in, in many different uh, food banks. And as you were saying before, it's not that here that one solution fits all. We are having conversations on site with the different food banks. And for some of you, the interesting thing is to help design a new warehouse. For others, like I think in Italy we did last a uh, couple of years ago, it is, can you help me with, with my transportation costs, with my logistics costs? And of course, we buy a huge amount of transportation capacity through the year, so we definitely can help that. And uh, so in a nutshell, these are the different ways we can collaborate. For those of you who are not collaborating with logistics company, I, I encourage you to do it because the, the price is, is, is important. And for us, I have to say that it has been a privilege. It is now part of our culture in terms of, uh, of the employee engagement that, we, that we've gotten through this collaboration. It has gone through the roof. No? People come to me and say, you know, I feel proud to work in a company that can do this. You know, it is not anymore my logistics expertise is, is helping reducing the cost for the P&L at the end of the month. You know, it's really making a difference for the people who, who need that. So, so hopefully we will continue for a long time and hopefully we will continue creating solutions to solve the supply chain challenges together.
That's amazing because it's really true to the business case. It's not a hard sell because you are a logistics company and the support they give is in logistics. Yeah. It's no different than transport companies kind of lending freezer trucks so that you can transport the food and take them to food banks. I mean, it doesn't mean that you only give food to a food bank. It's these enabling infrastructure that is so at the heart of your business. And I do hope logistics companies take a bit of inspiration, but also discover <laughs> what that means in terms of bringing it locally. Yeah. Um, Paul earlier talked about technology, and we know that technology is a tool. It shouldn't be the heart of what we do. That is just a tool to do what we do better. And so I'm going to circle back to you, Facundo. You um, have heard so many of the apps being thrown around. Um, how does Danone use technology to foster greater collaboration and really, I guess, make that relationship even tighter? What is that role in Danone? Well, technology is... Is, is now changing the dynamics of our understanding of what's going on in, in several ways. So first, understanding consumers. So now we have a different type of listening, understanding what consumer wants. So that's the best way to reduce food waste. No? Listening, understanding consumers, giving meaningful products to them and connected with them. So this is one way. Obviously, this is also connected to the way they, they purchase. So the shopper experience is linked to technology now. Mm. So when they buy, they, they use technologies, and, and we can learn from that. But also, if we do it together with retailers, we can learn more about consumers. And we can offer them what they want in a proper way, so we can reduce food waste. Mm. But also, we have seen different initiatives that are connecting the food banks with the retailers or with the industry to reduce food waste. But the, the issue here is that we are having like a, a boom in terms of creation of, of, of new applications. So applications here, there, everywhere. So we need to scale up. So technology is great, but we need to join efforts because this is not competitive, it's pre-competitive and could be meaningful to unleash the power of this value chain. Mm. So technology is about connection. So. <laughs> We are convinced that we, we will identify new and new projects, locally relevant, based on new technological platforms. And that is what we have identified linked to logistics for sure, because it's better to, to use our consumers to, to, to take these products from shelves before expiration. And this is reducing a lot the cost. And also, if we use the technology, to connect consumers and to be part of this, maybe they will be part of an activation linked to donations to the food banks. Mm -hmm. So it's a different type of value creation. Technology is allowing us to think these alternatives in a different way. It's not about the physical donation. It's reducing food waste because consumers could continue buying at, at, di at the last phase of this, uh, the life of the product, and we could connect the consumer with the food banks as with concrete people in lo locally relevant to feed the system in a proper way, in a new way. And we have seen initiatives in, in, in US linking the, the restaurants, reservations, applications with donations that are relevant for food banks. We have seen uh, uh, applications that are uh, capturing the uh, empty or the available uh, logistic capacity uh, at a small scale to recover a small amount of, of small uh, uh, donations from retailers or even from, from manufacturers. So there is a huge opportunity around technology. It's on us to connect and to scale up. Otherwise, it's not going to work at the level that could work. Yeah. It only is there to support the data that yeah. you, you find, right? And Maria, I'm going to shift to you a little bit because I think you also use mobile apps and again with the overlay of zero malnutrition I think it just really forces the hand to be more efficient to use technology to connect the food banks to the farmers this is a, a, a different way of working together can you tell us a bit more about how the mobile app has helped you um, in, in the work that you do eh, bueno, nosotros eh, estamos intentando en este momento poner tecnología porque definitivamente los datos son muy necesarios en nuestras tiendas porque tenemos tiendas de todos los tamaños. Eh, estamos trabajando de la mano de Abaco buscando precisamente una tecnología que se adapte a nuestras necesidades porque de todas maneras somos multimarcas 
y adicional a eso es un proceso extra en la operación, pero como lo dice eh, Facundo, es necesario trabajar con la tecnología, ya que las, los productos que salen de las tiendas tienen muy corta fecha. El retail realmente no tiene la fecha que puede tener un productor, entonces el tiempo se vuelve en contra del banco de alimentos para poder tener un aprovechamiento de este producto. En estos momentos nosotros contamos con la información que levantan los bancos de alimentos en nuestras tiendas sobre el aprovechamiento y el no aprovechamiento del producto que se le entrega en la tienda. Pero más allá de eso, lo que necesitamos es que la comunicación sea en el momento justo de entregar el producto para que si el banco de alimentos tiene la logística necesaria para ir a recoger este producto, lo haga de manera rápida y pueda utilizar ese producto en la persona que lo necesita, en las cantidades que lo necesitan y de las características del producto que necesitan, porque nosotros donamos de todo tipo de productos, somos un retail que dona tanto alimentos como no alimentos, entonces a la hora de entregar, eh, no sé, un textil, no es lo mismo a la hora de entregar una leche, entonces es la oportunidad de entrega en el tiempo que lo requerimos y realmente la aplicación será una herramienta necesaria para lograr la efectividad en la comunicación. Apenas lo estamos, eh, digamos, terminando de entender para poder empezar y yo creo que en Latinoamérica este será un paso muy grande. Nosotros, como les contamos, estamos en cuatro países, somos independientes, pero de manera permanente empezamos a entender cuáles son las mejores prácticas de cada uno de los retail en el país. Entonces yo creo que arrancar en Colombia sería arrancar próximamente en Brasil, Argentina y Uruguay. That's That's very good, and I think, you know, as we talk about borderless um, food banking support, I think technology can really bridge that gap. Um, JJ, how does technology for you as a logistics company, you're already in that business of connecting the players in the supply chain, right? Does technology, how does smart use of technology enhance that? In our experience, technology is changing everything and it will change even more. And if there, we are very close, we, we are part of the food industry because we are giving the services to the food industry. And I can tell you that, well, first of all, uh, specifically for the problem of food waste, since this famous report of foul that everyone quotes, you know, one third of the food is lost, I've seen directly that this is not just talking, the industry has taken action. And I know that because they are contacting us as a logistics provider to help with the solution. And, um, and, uh, and the idea, there, there is, uh, the, the idea behind, the potential solution has to do a lot with, uh, with traceability and transparency across the whole supply chain. And this is an extremely complicated issue. You know, if you just go to a supermarket, to any product that is relatively complex in the supermarket, with, with a few ing ingredients, you can imagine how difficult it is to trace, you know, not just the product, but the ingredients behind the, the product. Where you go three or four or five steps, and then the chain, boom, you know, it, 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 it creates a, a huge amount of branches. You are talking about really millions of points that you need to, to track and trace. And this is where technology comes into play. You need a strong technology foundation if you want to do that. And this is, you know, for me, correct me if I'm wrong, because you are the owners of the, of this, of the food industry, but this is, well, we see that this is an obsession, for the, a good obsession for, for, the, for the industry for, for several reasons. For uh, food, uh, food safety, since the famous horse meat and scandal also, this is something that, it's very, that everyone is very concerned and it is very aware. But also consumers want to know more. Where is this, this stuff coming from, you know? The strawberries from this yogurt, maybe? Are they from next door or are they from another continent? Uh, they, they want to know that and then make purchasing decisions uh, um, according to that. And then as always, this is not new, this has always been there, it is the efficiency problem. Supply chain is about efficiency and we have been very limited in, in the measures, in the kind of efficiencies that we have gotten in the past by the visibility that we have. If you were lucky, you could have some, uh, some initiatives with your supplier or with your customer, but try to go five steps upstream, good luck with that, you know? And this is where, where, where technology can enable all these different things. And um, I have to say that as far as I know, there is still not a, a solution that is working very well for, for this. You, you, okay. And then, uh, but uh, we, are, we are involved in, uh, we are trying to find a solution because one potential idea is Why don't we get the traceability of the food supply chain, of the supply chain, by the packaging? Mm -hmm. 
You know, things move on pallets, things move on crates, on containers, so maybe the way to track and trace, you know, and what is happening throughout the supply chain is through the packaging. We believe that is the case as well, that that can be done, and we are working, uh, we are working there. But I would love to see, you know, I think if, you know, the vision, if, if, we, if we had a standard for this, a, te a technological standard that is accepted, that is widely used, that will unlock a huge amount of opportunities in these three areas that I, that I have uh, mentioned. However, there are different initiatives, some of them local, some of them the, in, in, in the country, but there is nothing, there is not a technology that works in a standard way, a standard yeah. way in the whole supply chain yet. Let's hope that we're all working towards that. And Claire, I'm going to let you uh, weigh in on this because the use of technology um, empowers the consumer at home. You know, we talk about supply chain as it happens outside, but you want the consumer to be able to make this decision and bring it home. So what are your thoughts on that at RAP? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So actually, I'm going to go against the grain a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't think technology is the key factor. Technology is just a way of connecting people. The only way we're going to fix the problems in the supply chain to do with food donation, to do with food waste production, etc., is by changing the way that people do business and the way that people behave at home. Um, technology is one way of doing that. So for our consumer campaign, yes, we use Instagram and Facebook to push out our messages, but ultimately that's just... Uh, the transition mechan me mechanism. So mm -hmm. unless people change their behaviour at home or at work, um, it doesn't make any difference whether you have an app or whether you're on Instagram. I think a really interesting example of this, so uh, Dave Lewis and, and Lindsay yesterday were talking about the partnership that Fairshare has with Tesco. So yes, that is a technology-enabled partnership but the real key why that worked is because what Tesco did was they embedded it into their existing processes and they trained people to say okay so this is just the third step after the other two that you're already doing yeah. and the fact that it's technology enabled is is just part that's how they do business the key to it was the people and how people in store were behaving yeah. and, and another element of that project was again about the connections between the store and the food bank or whoever was collecting mm -hmm. you come in the front door you're a customer it's not like oh I'm just going to go around the back it's this kind of leftover food it was the it was the relationship between the two kinds of organisations. Yes, it was enabled by technology, but ultimately the reason why it's successful is because of the people. Yeah. And I think that's our approach, especially through the voluntary agreements as well, is that bringing people together who would not normally have a productive relationship or maybe who don't even really talk to each other that much. Mm. Um, and creating a space with an independent... Um, organization to kind of host that discussion to say look we recognize that sometimes the problem is happening over here but the root cause of it is over here and that you might have to do something that costs you money over here and actually the savings gonna happen over here and how do you square that circle and honestly you know a te technology is good for pinpoint solutions across that supply chain and within that whole infrastructure but the relationships and the discussions between people is what really drives that change. Yeah, it's all about relationships, as we said yesterday, and I think today that's even more underscored. Um, we have less than 15 minutes for questions, and I promise we'll bring you into the conversation. So now's the time for questions. If you could just put your hands up, state your name, your affiliation, and we'll go from there. Yes, ma'am. Again, the microphones are going to be going Hola. around. Uh, Tere García, de Bancos de Alimentos de México. Trabajamos de hecho con Danone y con Chep en México y también hemos colaborado con Grab. Muchas gracias. Dos preguntas, una para Facundo. ¿Cómo ve Danone globalmente a los bancos de alimentos y qué podríamos hacer específicamente para volvernos parte natural de la cadena de suministro de Danone? Que se vea como este último eslabón. Y para María José de Éxito, me gustaría un poquito más de información sobre cómo manejan la logística de reversa para la colaboración que tienen con los bancos de alimentos, si pudieras compartirnos un poco más de detalles. Muchas gracias. So, thanks for the question. In fact, I don't think you are the last part of the value chain. Could be that you are the first part. 
<coughs> so why not? No? You, so, so we were saying about, we were talking about the new definition of the value chain, including the value creation. So sometimes we are just talking with the food banks and we realize what is going on. And what you are receiving is a signal of what is not working well in our product design or in our connection with consumers. Sometimes uh, we realize that the most important thing is the, what we are developing in terms of nutritional quality for you. But also you know well what are the needs from your communities in terms of nutritional needs. So understanding consumers and increasing the impact is about a lot of understanding of that piece. So I think we need to reshape the conversation starting from what is the impact we want to have together. And after that, we are going to unleash what could be there in the middle of the value chain. Okay. Eh, bueno, para darte respuesta, nosotros en el grupo de éxito lo que hacemos es que retiramos de nuestras eh, góndolas el producto que está próximo a vencerse o que tiene una maduración en un punto intermedio. Lo llevamos a la trastienda y en nuestras bodegas lo que hacemos es que eso se le damos de baja al inventario y luego se le entrega al banco de alimentos. Digamos que esa es la forma natural en la que se hace, pero... Hace más o menos un año estamos trabajando en un proyecto en donde estamos invitando a nuestros proveedores a que no devuelvan el producto hasta el centro de distribución porque lo que pasa muchas veces es que a través de la logística en reversa del grupo de éxito se lleva el producto del proveedor hasta el centro de distribución, esto tiene un costo inverso y cuando está allá se le debe avisar al, al proveedor que este producto ya se va a vencer y no se pudo vender en la tienda. Porque hay productos, eh, hago una explicación, y es que en Colombia nosotros no todos los productos que tenemos exhibidos en la tienda son comprados. Algunos son del proveedor que están puestos en nuestros anaqueles. Entonces lo que pasa con esto es que el producto que vuelve al centro de distribución, le estamos diciendo al proveedor, entrégueselo al banco de alimentos, sabemos que es suyo, pero permítanos entregarlo porque esa logística en reversa le va a tener un costo extra. De esta manera aprovechamos costos para el proveedor, aprovechamos costos de espacio en nuestros centros de distribución y lo que hacemos es que el banco aproveche este producto. Morning. My name is Sendro from Indonesia. Uh, I'm working with Danon in Indonesia. Um, but unluckily, uh, government and some of publics um, targeting uh, formula milk as a quote-unquote public enemy. I don't know the trend globally, but I want to know if you have uh, something or uh, thinking about the plan how to solve this kind of uh, trend. Thank you. Thanks for the question. In fact, in each geography, we are having different type of conversations. Sometimes it's linked to our manufacturing footprint. In Indonesia, we have a huge water business and also baby food. So when we talk about uh, food banks, usually we try to work more on the piece that is fitting well with the, understand, the common understanding that it's good to be done. And in the case of some markets, we are focusing our efforts in the water access more than in other categories, and then working with the governments to, to on the other territories that could be uh, linked to some regulatory topics. So it's about the same message I, 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 I gave you before. It should be locally relevant and locally uh, associated to the right stakeholders. So in the case of Indonesia, in the case of Mexico, in the case of Spain, in the case of Argentina, in US, we operate worldwide. So we have war different, really very, very different realities in each market where we operate. So we need to be flexible to adapt our approaches and to understand what makes sense in terms of focus for us. Hello, uh, my name is Ari. I'm, I live in Argentina. I'm from Uruguay. Uh, we've developed an application 
called Nilus uh, that uh, crowdsources uh, last mile delivery of uh, food waste. Uh, and we're rescuing food in Argentina now in urban environments um, and working in alliance with the Argentine network of food banks and two food banks in Rosario Mar del Plata. So in our experience uh, and to Juan Jose's comment about the uniform standards, I, I think it's, it's, it's really important. And I was wondering, what do you think about a, a platform where we would everybody opens their technology and their code so that we try to standardize uh, uh, not, not only from food banks, but from food banks and supermarkets and all the uh, uh, players in the industry um, the technology itself and the information so that you can cross it freely. Uh, we, we don't see a reason why we would not open all our codes or technology because you end up uh, differentiating your product based on your quality and not your secret information on the code. So um, so do you think that would work, something like that with Brambles or, or in Exito? Or do you think there is appetite in the industry for open standards of information to connect logistics with products? I, I, I definitely think there is, a, there is an appetite in the industry because I'm experiencing it every day, but we are in this phase now where you have different things appearing, you know, and, and you have the, Germany, the Germans with GS1, then, the, sorry, if I go to technical, you have uh, that are proposing right now on a standard, and the US, you have another one, and then you have some open standards, and then you have some proprietary standards that maybe you are using with your applications. So we are in this, in this time where we have too many things, I will say, and I, I, I believe that we will go through a consolidation phase, and finally we will have one, uh, for me, the important thing, it's better if it is open because it will, be, it will open more opportunities for many different players and it will be cheaper, etc. But uh, for me, the, the ultimate goal is that we have an, an standard that everyone can use, that is not a property of anyone. For me, this is a pre-competitive issue and it is being dealt with and it is being managed in a pre-competitive pre pre environment like the Consumers Good Forum, like the World Economic Forum, uh, etc. So I'm very optimist. Definitely there is an, ap an appetite, but my view is that it won't happen tomorrow because the complexity is absolutely huge. You need to solve the, 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 um, the reality of a grower in Argentina and Walmart at the same time and everything in between, you know, and everything in between. Uh, so every time I ask scratch a little bit and I go into the technical de details of it, oh dear, you know, I, I, I panic a, li a little bit, but the intention is absolutely there because as I said before, the level of opportunity that it can unlock is just unbelievable. No? Imagine you have a Google for this, you know, it's, it's that. You know, once you, we have the HTML and the internet technologies, now you can search and, and find almost on anything in terms of general information. Imagine you have something similar for the food industry across the whole supply chain, that will be it. Maria, do you want to answer that too, or you'll pass? Um, bueno, no, yo sí creo, estoy de acuerdo contigo, nosotros hoy estamos en un punto en donde, bueno, eh, las personas, todo inicia como desde una sensibilidad de las personas eh, que trabajan y de nuestros clientes, pero sin lugar a dudas hoy la tecnología juega un papel muy importante, no estará terminada de inventar jamás, creo que siempre encontraremos oportunidades y también depende de la región, de las necesidades que tenga eh, la tienda, que tenga el cliente o que tenga incluso, eh, porque trabajamos para los bancos de alimentos, entonces la necesidad que tenga los bancos de alimentos, yo creo que es encontrar ahí la respuesta hoy, hoy, hoy la estamos construyendo. Fantastic. We have time for one more quick question. So who's got a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Hola, mi nombre es Claudia Almenares, vengo del Banco de Alimentos de Rosario de Argentina. Y la pregunta es para todos. Actualmente nuestro modelo de gestión en los bancos de alimentos dependen de los malos procesos de producción de las empresas. Entre más mal les vaya a ustedes produciendo, a nosotros nos va mejor en el rescate. ¿Qué va a pasar cuando los hagan bien? So I, 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 I take that. Yes, I, I can take that because, no, in fact, I mentioned that before. Because uh, as uh, successful we are, uh, reduce understanding consumers, we are going to reduce this surplus at point of sale. But there is also an emerging trend that is uh, sustainable diets. And it's about understanding the cultural shift that we are, there is a, something changing now 
that is reconnecting the consumer with these needs that part of the society is having. So it's not about environment as a dissociated thing from people. It's about people in their environment. It's about health and planet. So there is something that is beyond the technical problem of, of our level of, of production. So I think that the, the value added of the food banks is beyond the logistics. It's beyond the, 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 the factual thing of the actual thing of saving the food. It's about understanding what is needed there at local level and bringing solutions. So there is a role to play for the food banks beyond the efficiencies. Bear, do you want to chime in? Yeah. I think there's just two quick things I would say about that. So one is that there will always be surplus. We can't have a food system that is so lean that there's no surplus because how would we then deal with shocks to that system or fluctuations in, some, in supply and demand? So there will always be surplus, and Dave Lewis said that yesterday. Like You physically cannot match up supply and demand for every product every day of the year. It just doesn't happen. I think the other slightly more controversial thing is that we really need to think about this in a bigger context. You know, our food system is massively wasteful and we grow a bunch of food and then we throw it in a hole in the ground. So that prevention piece has to come first from a climate change perspective, from a social perspective, from an environmental perspective, even from a financial perspective on a national level. So I'm talking about kind of national scale GDP. Like that prevention piece has to come first. That supply chain efficiency has to come first. Fantastic. And I'm afraid that's all the time we've got. Again, we can talk for hours about this. But ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a round of applause to my <laughs> panel. Thank you. Facundo, JJ, Maria, and Claire, I'm sure you're going to be around over the next couple of days, so feel free to approach them. And we'll transition out to the next panel, if I can invite you to have a little break. And we're going to show a quick video as well. Um, while you <laughs> We don't know which way to get off, but we're going to show a quick video just to set the context for the next panel. Food has changed remarkably over the past 50 years. A growing population that we need to feed means more change ahead. This is James. This is James's life. As James grows up, issues like climate change will affect the production and consumption of food. This is James's future. Business as usual means that James can only see what's immediately in front of him. But business unusual means looking at the world around him and identifying challenges further ahead. Increasing competition for land, water, energy and food. Plus a decline in our natural resources, like the fish in our oceans. But we can work together and identify solutions to make things better for James. New technologies, partnerships and practices will help us respond to and improve the way we produce and consume food. The reality is, for better or worse, James will have a different food experience than the one we have today. Whether he's dining in or out. There's an alternative future for James. The choices we make today decide James's tomorrow. We all have a role to play in creating a good life for James and for us all. Find out what the choices are and what we can all do to create a better future. Thank you again to Claire for sharing that. That's a good video. Um, right on time and right into the heart of emerging trends in terms of actors that are shaking up the food system landscape and that's what we're going to focus on in this panel. But as promised, we are also changing things up with another poll, so if we can flash the second poll now, so that was a good round for the first one. So again, if you go to livevoxvote.com, um, if you click that site again, it should just show you the second question. So the second question is, by 2030, who will be the leading actor in food supply chain in urban areas? So time starts now. So you've got farmers, wholesalers, industries, retailers online, retailers traditional, and logistics operations. There are no right or wrong answers. 
just feel free to take a pick and let's see where this gets us. It's very predictable to yeah. see online retailers now just having gone through <laughs> our first panel, but it's also interesting to see, let's see who the close second is. Four seconds, three, two, one. Thank you, everyone. So we have a clear winner yet again, um, online retailers. But JJ, I think we owe it to you to raise the awareness of logistics companies to be part of the system. And that's very exciting. Um, right. I also want to welcome my panel officially. So we've got Joaquin um, of MIT, also a very intriguing role. And we're looking forward to hear your research as well. Mike Watkins, um, head of retailer and business insight for Nielsen. Um, Carrie Denniston, who has a massive portfolio on the giving side of Walmart Foundation. Um, and David Bellamy, um, chair of the Food Waste Working Group for Food Drink Europe, but also Food Drink Federation in the UK. Um, again, this, is ses this session is about the trends in the changing actors in the food system landscape. We just took a deep dive in supply chain per se, and we heard things like technology and online retailers. But we'll look at some of the other changes that are happening um, that we had to look out for. So, JJ, I'm going to start with you, MIT. Um, I think we're very blessed to have um, MIT represented in FBLI this year. But what are your thoughts on the global trends that you're seeing? You're kind of in the space of watching trends as well, and this is where your research is on. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to CFN. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so let me first introduce uh, the context where I think uh, we're immersed now, uh, and especially where the food banks are operating and will continue uh, operating in the forthcoming future. A uh, decade ago, uh, two researchers from the University of Cardiff um, delineated a new framework uh, to understand food issues. And I think this, this uh, framework is still valid and it's still up to date, and I would, I would like to resignify it and, and bring some ideas regarding it. Uh, this framework was called the New Food Equation, and in my perspective, this New Food Equation is an, a new state of governance of the food systems where the cities appear as a new scale uh, to, to, to tackle the, the food issues ra rather than the global or the national scale. So in this new scale, private actors and the public and the non-governmental actors as well are putting together their efforts toward achieving food security. So there are three main elements that constitute and, and, and conform this, the new, new, this new food equation. The first one is uh, the food prices. As you know, uh, this was the starting point of the, this new food equation. In 2007, we had a price boom on global commodities. And this price boom was, uh, for instance, when uh, the FAO uh, price index rose 50% in only five, five years, between 2002 and 2007. So th this was a huge boost that put uh, food security as a global issue uh, of national security even. So the thing is that this uh, context of, price of, of prices is still ongoing, and in my opinion, there are no elements to, to, to think that it's going to change. So during the last decade, the 10-year challenge uh, of the FAO price index is very, is very uh, Concern. We, we should be very concerned about it because the, the price levels stay, stay at, a very, at a very high level. Uh, of course, we have some down and up, upward slopes, but the price levels is, is kept between 130, 36 and 166 points, having 100 in the, in the year 2002. So between 2007 and 2018, so between 2010 and 2018, we reached a very high level of prices. And last year, for instance, we finished the year with 140 points in comparison with 
2002, that was 100 in, in terms of food prices, global food prices. So the second element that is really relevant in this discussion is the, is the rate of urbanization. Uh, again, in 2007, this was a, a crucial year. Uh, the urban population surpasses the, the rural population at the global scale. So now, uh, the 7.6 billion inhabitants that we are now in the, in the world, 55% of this population is living in urban areas. So this is a very big issue to, to put uh, the food supply in the, in the, at the city level. This situation is repeated in two-thirds of the country. Two-thirds of the country have more urban population than rural population. And the, the other important element is that between now and 2030, the growth of the urban population will be in cities of more than one million inhabitants. So the, the, cities are not, the, the population is not only moving to cities, but it's mostly mo moving to bigger cities. So this, this is going to bring a very challenging logistic uh, uh, ambient. And finally, regarding urbanization, um, this process has been also bringing a reduction of poverty and a, and a reduction of inequality, but at the same time, uh, push a lot of people to informality. So, for instance, 25% of the urban population nowadays live in informal settlements, while 44% of the population work in, have an informal employee. And finally, the, th the third element that I would like to, to bring to you is climate change, that of course is a big issue. But I would like to focus this in, in just one thing. Climate change is mostly bringing very intense and localized climate events like floods and, and droughts. And this is a very challenging uh, aspect of climate change. And for instance, just to have an idea, 85% of the cereals and oil seeds uh, production globally are only concentrated in five crops that are grown in some few areas, areas around the world. So climate change is bringing a precise uh, risk to this uh, to these lo localized production areas. I think that scene on the new food equation really changing with all these drivers just kind of forces the hand on new players in, in the landscape, right? And Carrie, I want you to kind of shed more light on these new players because we talked a lot about online retailers, but I think we really need to understand what is that precisely? What are these omni channels that we keep mentioning as part of this food new, uh, new food equation, but also in your experience in Walmart? Sure. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be with you uh, this morning and, and get to share with you a little bit about this. So normally I get to speak about Walmart's philanthropy and our giving and the work that we're doing in food systems. Um, and some of you may be familiar with the commitments we've made around hunger and nutrition and food waste globally. Um, and we can talk lots, lots more about that uh, anytime after the session. But today, I wanted to share with you a little bit about these trends. Um, we also have the fortunate position of sitting within the company of Walmart. Um, and for anyone that may not be familiar with us, um, we are a retail organization first and foremost. We started certainly as a bricks and mortar store that people go into. We are now in 27 countries around the world in 11,000 communities um, and employ about 2 million people around the world. And the nature of who Walmart is today is a transformation landscape. And I think transformation is the point in the story in which we are today. So I want to share a little bit about what that means for us because I think it has some direct implications for how we think about who food banking is in the future and the kinds of transformations that I'm seeing in this sector as well. So what is omnichannel? Um, I said we started as bricks and mortar. We are in some ways a retail store. We are in a lot of ways an online retailer. Um, we are also a technology company. We are a logistics company in some ways. We are a platform company through things like the acquisition of Flipkart in India. Um, so this is a very diverse and different company than we were even when, when I joined the company almost seven years ago. And so why is that? Why is that 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 nature is, is transforming so quickly and it, it has to be something new? And it starts with a customer. I loved the poll this morning where we had customer was like 7% and technology was 55%. <laughs> As a retailer, that's very confusing to us because it really starts with what customers need and what they expect. 
And retailers are obsessed with that, absolutely obsessed with customers. And their expectations about how they want to interact are, are changing dramatically. So I want to be able to order on an app. I want to be able to walk in online. I want to be able to have things delivered to my house. And in, for some countries represented in the room, you probably have an expectation that that's not two days or five days or seven days, that that's a matter of hours or increasingly in a matter of minutes. Right? So the pace in which we want to be able to access and interact with our food system is changing dramatically. Um, so that customer obsession and that expectation of what is needed and what can technology bring me and how can I be able to access that changes the way that our retail business is happening, but it's also probably changing the way that you are able to think about food banking as well. So as you think about your customer obsession, um, first of all, are you really clear on who your customer is? And is your team really clear on who your customer is? Do you feel like if you had a conversation about is it our agencies, is it our community, is it the people that we serve, that everyone in your organization would give the same answer to that question? We are extremely clear on who our customer is and the changing expectations that they have. What is that tool and how do you utilize that? And if you, once you have that, what gaps in that information do you not have? What don't you know about the changing reality of their experience and what they expect from you? And are you having that conversation directly with them? That's how we get this information about where we need to go to. Um, and then the third question that we've asked within that is where is our own process and our own belief about what we can deliver just getting in the way? Um, we you know, had traditionally really put all of our resources and energy into how we make our stores and system the best that it could possibly be. Um, we had to think differently when customers wanted something different from us. And so we had to take the assets that we have and start to transform them. So that customer piece of this is where everything else begins. It is always about people. It is always about figuring out who we are trying to serve and being able to do that better. So what are the implications then for the food system? And I'm going to give you three really quick examples of how that has changed what we do from a food system perspective and what we're seeing across the chain. So the first one is that everything has to be about efficiency within that model. So if we're trying to drive towards efficiency, the first thing we have to do is think about where are we incentivizing decisions that should be made differently. So Claire gave the example of the potatoes earlier of we ask why, ask why, ask why. We have a very similar set of examples over and over again. One that I can give is that um, strawberries, very uh, perishable product. We were having real issues with how they are getting to the store level. And from a food banking perspective, such a short shelf life that even if we're getting them into the system, it's just really challenging for everyone to be able to handle them all across the chain. We started asking why and why and why and figured out that we were sending strawberries into stores with a very short life on them. And so the pressure to be able to get them out and get them sold quickly enough it just, it wasn't working. And so what we started to do was actually donate more from our distribution centers before they ever went out to the stores. We were just never even sending them in the first place if they didn't meet a higher standard or a fewer days or a longer shelf life on the, the freshness side. What that did is it took about a day and a half out of the supply chain. Um, it made it better for food banks getting fresher product. And it helped us to deliver and take waste out of the system. We actually decreased our waste just in that, that pilot that we did by about 100 million units over a year. That's a significant amount of food waste reduction. And that system was made more efficient. Second quick example of thinking about how the food system is really changing is as we think about how do we automate for the kinds of um, information and processes that can be made more accurate through automation. So this isn't a, a plug for automation for all things, but where within our food system are we seeing technology start to change how the food system is coming together? So an example of this, I'm continuing with strawberries today. We, we had it with our yogurt earlier too was thinking about um, how, how strawberries are actually handled and picked throughout the supply chain. There's a lot of technology and testing that's going on in thinking about can machines actually select strawberries, figure out when they are ripe. Now, today, they're not really good at it because it's very hard to tell when something is at the perfect peak of freshness, and also they're very delicate. 
Um, and so being able to do that without creating additional food waste in the short term, um, over time, we're gonna see more and more of this throughout and across the supply chain. So that'll be another significant piece. And the third is how do we actually think about transparency to fuel speed? So the examples were given earlier around food safety and how we use digital and information to try and capture more insight deeper across the supply chain over time. We've done quite a few experiments with blockchain. Um, and so one example of this is we had our first pilot in this was a food safety pilot in thinking about a pack of mangoes. So any guesses, we had gone to our team and our, our leader of food safety at the time said, tell me where this came from. How long do you think it took us to, to trace it back to the farm? Wow. A week? One day? One day over here? It took us seven days. Seven days to get back to the farm. We talked about how quickly you get to millions of nodes in a supply chain. It took us seven days. We started piloting with blockchain and the technology, put it in implementation in place. Now this isn't about the technology, this is about the people and the trust and the insight and the information and building that all the way across. Then we repeated the pilot. How long do you think it took us to figure out where the mango came from? An hour? 10 minutes? 2.2 .2 seconds. That is the power of how we can think differently about technology driving insight. It's not about the technology, it's about the insight. So what does that have to do with food banking? What does all of this have to do with food banking is we think about the transformation of this system. What this means for the food banking sector is not necessarily that the pace of change or that we've gotta be implementing all of these same things, but the same lessons of how we apply thinking about this transformation to the food system absolutely apply to this business model as well. And it will mean, and will continue to mean, that where food is available, the quantity and how fresh it is will continue to be in flux. So in the strawberry example, those strawberries are no longer at the store, and in small quantities, they may be at the distribution center in a larger quantity. In thinking about the transparency of the blockchain, that may mean we know when food is gonna be available in a faster clip. How are we building efficiencies into the food bank system to respond to that? So we think about the automation and the technology, that may mean there's more food waste in some areas and nodes of the system, where increasingly there was less in, in other areas of the system. How is your infrastructure able to respond and think about the flexibility that's needed within those nodes um, and building the capacity for that? Claire spoke yesterday about, in the US system, Feeding America, thinking about what's fewer, um, few, smaller packages of donation, but in more frequency and in more places. How do we think about on farm where we may have larger quantities that need to be picked up, but ha don't have a consistency to them? What does your infrastructure need to look like to be able to respond to that? I hope in all of that you hear the message of it's, it's actually exciting mm. <laughs> because I know that that's a lot and can be overwhelming thinking about the overall food system. But at the end of the day, I've been around this network a long time, food banks are not warehouses, food banks are not the agency networks in which they serve, food banks are innovators, and food banks are people. And so I think this challenge is one that this network globally is very much equipped to handle. Thanks, Carrie. I think that transformation piece, whilst it's all about modernizing and getting ahead, it's so clear that it also requires trying to kind of reflect and just really think about who are we trying to serve in the first place? You know, what do customers really, really want? Because at the end of the day, it's understanding them and that should drive the way that you run your business. And I'm going to turn to no less than an expert in terms of customer insights, Mike. Um, Mike is not in the system of food banking, but on the overall, do customers really care about um, food waste management and really so much that, you know, as Claire said in the first panel, um, make decisions and change habits at home. So, um, Mike, what, what have you seen in your, in your studies? Well, thank you, Pat, and good morning, everybody. So, Nielsen is a global data measurement and insight company, and we look across over 100 countries and try and give some foresight into the emerging consumer trends. So, there's four really exciting things you see happening for the future that are relevant to global food banking. So the first thing builds upon what the last two speakers were talking about is, I'm going to call it a little and often, uh, more urbanization, change the structure of the family means we're shopping for smaller shopping baskets, 
closer to home, be it home delivery or the local convenience store. What's interesting is in these highly urbanised areas and where the lit and often lifestyle trend is the greatest, over half of the shopping basket is now fresh food. Short life, fresh food. So that instinctively provides a challenge to food waste. So that's something which is both an opportunity but clearly a challenge for the supply chain. Secondly, and in no particular order, we're seeing a macro trend on health, well-being, and within that quality, food that's good for me and also good for environment. When we surveyed over 30,000 consumers last year, nearly half of these global consumers are saying they're more inclined, they're prepared, they're willing to consider to pay actually slightly more for better quality food if it's linked to more sustainable business practices. There's a link between quality, health and well-being, sustainability. The whole ecosystem is starting to come together. Thirdly, and this is a very specific thing, there's a great interest on consumers uh, around food provenance, particularly in developed markets, highly uh, affluent countries, such as some of the European and North American countries, where provenance, trust, traceability, and food security is very much top of mind. Um, to put it into local context, in the UK, over half of UK shoppers actively want to buy local food, British, Irish, food for the local farmer's market, for a number of reasons. They believe it's good quality, it's better for me, better for the environment, and also it helps to reduce air miles, food miles, and food waste. And last but not least, there's a much deeper emotional connection with environmental social concerns. And this is a generational thing. I think of all the four things I mentioned, this has the biggest long-term impact. We talk a lot about the millennials, how they shop and spend differently, but let's think about what we call locally Generation Z, the economically active people coming into the market, they're under 20, under 22, they bring with completely different expectations. They're digital natives, they have a much stronger affinity with sustainability. And this is a generational shift and that's going to set the agenda for the next 10 years, I think. For those who've worked in sustainability most of their lives or aspects of it, it's finally happening. That's <laughs> yeah. what I'm getting from We're you. We're at that tipping point. That's excellent, but also there's a whole <laughs> world of opportunity in terms of as a food bank, we can now reflect on what role do we really want to play in that? Because we want to make sure that we extend the access to the good food, good health piece, and be able to kind of share that with whether it's charities that you work with or the end receiver. So just to pick up on that, um, Carrie mentioned that retailers are very obsessed with the consumer. And getting the shopper to change where they shop is often a holy grail for a retailer. Yeah. These younger shoppers are much more predisposed to change where they shop based upon ESG concerns. Mm. And I think you've just validated, your research was just validated by Nielsen talking. <laughs> um, because in a way you've seen everything is shifting urban and this new food equation really is kind of coming to the habits and the consumer power. Um, but I also want to bring in David in the conversation because now we can see that whilst there's a change in consumer interest, desire, there's different, you know, it's purposeful consumption hopefully is where we're going to. You found through your work that redistribution is now also, it's, it's also at the tipping point. It's also at a point of forcing a cultural shift and redistribution is indeed a valuable option. Can you tell us a bit more how you got there? Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, and thank you for inviting uh, me here today wear my Food Drink Europe hat. And Food and Drink Europe, in case you're not aware, is the main trade body for the European food and drink manufacturing industry uh, with its headquarters in Brussels. Um, yes, um, and, and, and Food and Drink Europe members, of course, it's probably worth just saying this at the outset. We, we strive for efficient, efficiency in our supply chains and avoiding food waste and surpluses in, in the first place. Having said that, uh, we know from the earlier panel session that things do go wrong, the world is not perfect, um, which is why we put aside some time a couple of years ago um, to work collaboratively with the European Federation of Food Banks and the European retailers, Eurocommerce, uh, to develop some guidelines for our industry um, around 
uh, food donation called Every Meal Matters, and these, these were published in 2016. And um, they were really around, because we don't set out to produce surpluses, generally speaking, as an industry, um, there are some companies that have it within their corporate culture to donate food. There are some exceptions, but most companies don't set out to donate food deliberately. Obviously, it arises when things go wrong in the system somehow. Um, but the essence of making good use of that food in a donation context is being prepared for that arising to happen. And, and having a culture within a company, having the systems there internally to deal with that surplus quickly, because time is of the essence, is what we are constantly told by the food donation community, that it's important to get that, that, that product that can't be sold through normal channels out into the donation community. So we put aside some time to develop some guidelines which were really trying to come to a common approach to how we define surplus in the first place, how we prepare ourselves internally for the eventuality of surplus arising, and, and then to work on how we sort of identify um, a partner to donate the food to, how we keep records, and how we communicate success. And um, these, these guidelines, as I say, were put together in 2016. And, um, and I think it's fair to say they were produced at a time where the whole culture around donation has been changing. Um, and that's for, in Europe, that is, and, and there's some good examples from the UK in that context as well. Um, the, obviously, um, generally around food waste, we've had the, the UN Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, um, which is very much widely supported by the European food industry. Um, we've had the work of the Champions 12.3, which I'm sure you heard about yesterday in terms of Dave Lewis's, uh, and that's had a number of very high-profile industry people supporting that work as well. Um, we've had the Global um, uh, Waste Resor uh, uh, World Resources Institute Global Food Standard um, that's been developed to help, um, if you like, assess performance against the 12.3 uh, target. And um, all these things have helped to raise the profile of the need to avoid food waste and, and to put food to good <coughs> use. And, and I think that has resonated in the, in the European food industry. Um, we, we want to work collaboratively across all um, parts of the value chain in our waste reduction work, and, and that includes the food donation community as well. So these guidelines were put together <clears throat> as a way of trying, uh, trying to reach out to that community, obviously preparing them with, with the support of the uh, of FIBA as well was helpful. Um, so that, that, that is where we, where we are. And um, it's also worth just saying we've had a, a big policy shift as well on food donation. Um, we, we know that food donation is, is recognised within... Uh, we've had a big package uh, called the Circular Economy Package in Europe, which contains, um, obviously... Um, policy but also some legislative changes um, within the revised directives that govern this whole space there is recognition that member states need to include food donation as part of their food prevention program um, we've also seen um, in the uk context we've seen the government very recently um, uh, set out um, how it wants to actually move forward on food donation in terms of looking at possibility of legal obligations on companies to report what they donate um, we've had commitments on the funding side from the UK government to support some of the barriers around donation. And, um, and not least, of course, um, the work of RAP in terms of developing the um, uh, food waste um, reduction commitment, um, which uh, as a national body, Food and Drink Federation, we very much support in the UK context. So um, I, I think we've seen, um, we have seen a culture shift from the policy side and, and also generally in terms of the general public discourse around food waste and, and the value of food donation. That's certainly been quite high in Europe. And, um, and, and we've seen, uh, and the figures bear it out. Uh, I've seen the latest figures from the European Federation of Food Banks. Um, I think the amount of uh, donated food in tonnage has gone up just between 2016 and 2017. Um, and the amount of recipients of uh, donated food has gone up to around just over 8 million in Europe from around 6 million in 2016. So we are trying to see traction in terms of the numbers. So things are turning around, but um, uh, you know, there's still more to do. And we definitely hope that that permeates other parts of the globe as well um, and that we take the learnings from there. I think isolating waste as 
the enemy, so to speak. That's what we're trying to combat, be more efficient to the level that we can, but also be efficient in terms of the food banking or the redistribution when it's a necessary um, option. But there are challenges in terms of embracing um, redistribution, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how companies that you work with in the working group, for example, have overcome some of these. Yes, um, yes, I mean, you're quite right. There, there are still challenges that remain. Uh, I think broadly the challenges can be broken down into financial challenges and non-financial challenges. And uh, the, the fan financial ones, I guess, um, are, are, are fairly obvious in many ways in the sense that obviously um, there are other options available to um, food and drink manufacturers when it comes to surpluses um, in terms of the, the, you know, the competition, if you like, from animal feed, um, we know that the other um, non-prevention options like recovery, anaerobic digestion as well, and in the past it's, it's been government policies often to support anaerobic digestion, and that has now changed. Um, and, and I mean, that, that is one of the big challenges, the financial side of it, because often at best um, donating food to a charity may be cost neutral for an organisation, but it can tip into the negative if you've got to actually pay for the transportation, uh, and such, so that there are some costs attached to it in, in pure monetary terms. And, and naturally, companies will want to get some sort of return for a surplus. Obviously, they're in the business of selling food, um, and, and, and obviously, there, there will be uh, options around that give them some sort of return. Um, you know, if that's a route to feed or if that's a donation route, you know, through one of the more commercial players. I know we're talking about largely the charitable sector here today, but there are commercial operators in this space notably in the UK, uh, and, and those obviously will be competing options in, in companies. Um, and the non-financial barriers will be, um, I mean, there's quite a list of these, um, uh, and I think um, it really boils down to the need for uh, a brand owner to have that assuredness, if you like. Uh, so my mic has gone, I think. Oh, there we go. Uh, um, to be assured that the uh, food that's donated is going to be kept safe and of acceptable quality because brand integrity is going to be key, obviously, going forward. If something goes wrong, it can undermine a whole brand. It's um, obviously quite, quite a high risk in that sense. So getting that assuredness of the handling of the food in the donation system is going to be key. I think the other thing stems from the fact that perhaps a perception from the industry is that the donation, the, the redistribution community, if you like, appears somewhat fragmented and can be quite inefficient to deal with. Um, so it would help perhaps if the community of redistribution um, used common language, used, um, used a, a common uh, compliance um, system, uh, assurance, um, common communication, and, and had sort of, if you like, a comprehensive um, transport and logistics offer as well. I think that would help greatly um, for food businesses to deal with that community. Um, because very often things um, may arise in relatively small quantities and are dispersed locations as well. So having access to sort of comprehensive transport infrastructure is going to be very helpful indeed. Um, and you know, I, I know there's been some talk about the possibility of some sort of standard for responsible redistribution. Um, because at the moment it, it's quite difficult as a food business to distinguish between those um, donation organisations that take donated food that are going to handle the food in, in the right way and provide that assurance and those that are not. It's, it, it's quite, um, it's quite a, a number of players and, and some of the churn of some of the smaller operators in the donation market is quite high as well. So um, perhaps, you know, that's probably, perhaps that's one of the way forward is, is some assured standard of redistribution that would provide that um, support for the food businesses. We're clearly hearing a, a leaning towards more standards, not too rigid, but just yeah. enough to kind of collect and put a structure in place. And I, I, I think it will resonate with everyone to hear that brands have the responsibility to ensure the highest quality. Um, they are trusted precisely for that, but also um, for the movers in the business. So Carrie, I'm gonna go back to you. Brands have that responsibility to lead and do the right thing, but you also have had a few leadership learnings, I guess, in the course of your transformation journey. So can you share a bit more what you've found out and how you've adjusted to that? Sure. We can talk about this for a really long time, I no, think. No, you only have a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go real fast. So as we think about, you know, transformation is 
really hard. Let's just all name that. It's it's incredibly, incredibly challenging. And so, you know, thinking about reflecting on well, how how do you even start with that, or or what does that what does that start to mean? Um, and I and a couple of things come come to mind that have been lessons learned. And I, I think the first one has been. The first, uh, what we started to see as a retail industry of starting to transform, so we talked about come to the customer, has also been be willing to hang out with people who you don't normally get along with. Um, and that means bring new ideas, be intensely curious about what's happening in the world. You know, how, how many conferences as, as this organization, have we talked about technology in the way, the way that this would be talked about today, that we're talking about things like what's happening in transformation and in these kinds of policies and on farm and, and what is uh, these other natures of what's happening in the world, automation, right? All of these different aspects that are coming in. We get that influence and we get that kinds of collaboration by really listening to other people and what they're experiencing. Um, our CEO is a pretty great guy, and, and he talks a lot about, I just hang out with people that are kind of weird, like that are really thinking about far out there ideas, because it starts to see that kind of innovative thinking within our own selves. And so I think that's been a, a real lesson for us, too, because the tendency is to be like, this is my business, and these are my people. And I'm also going to go out and find people who have that same sort of theory of action about the world that I have. And that can be helpful to find those people, but you got to find the opposite side too to continually challenge that and help us move forward. So I do think that's one piece. I think the second piece is um, because that is so hard, we often try to explain the complexity of that as opposed to simplifying for the people that we're trying to attract to work with us. Um, and so I think, for example, about like date labeling and how we've had all of this, we were trying to communicate all of this information. We've moved to this is best if it's used by in our private brand um, because a, a consumer doesn't actually need to necessarily know the rest. They need to know when I need to throw it away. Um, and so I think the same is true as we think about transformation for, all right, we're going to utilize this new technology, but our volunteers actually just need to know that they can go onto an app and they can show up and that that's going to work for them. They don't need to know how complex that it was on the back end. Um, and all of that, the major lesson I think that we've learned is that innovation is cool, um, but it is not the holy grail. And you have to actually incubate that kind of innovation while also strengthening the core of what you do. Because if... For us, in our example, if our stores are not well run and people don't come in and find what they're looking for at a great price, at great quality, with all the expectations that they have, with increasingly expectations on where did it come from and transparency on that, and if we don't do that and knock it out of the park, we don't get to do the other things. Um, and so thinking about how you shore up and put resources and double down on the core while you also incubate the innovation, one of the lessons that we've learned is for a period of time, we had to do those in parallel before bringing them together. Um, and so that is OK, too. It doesn't have to be doing one or the other or trying to do both and, and letting both suffer. You can actually separate those and then bring them together at a future point. That's really powerful. Joaquin, I want you to kind of circle back to you and bring us back where we started. You, all, you looked at global trends, but you're seeing now what it's like to be at local practice. Is this also validated by your research? Is this what you're seeing? Yeah, sure. Yeah, l l let me bring two examples. Uh, one from Argentina, where I'm from. Uh, regarding climate change, for instance, uh, the importance of building resilience structures and resilience uh, institutional arrangements uh, to be able to tackle uh, the climate risks. For instance, apples and pears production in Argentina, uh, they are mostly concentrated, concentrated in an area of 100, by 50, 100 kilometers by 50 kilometers. So it's very localized. Of course, it's, it's the, not the only, but the larger production area in Argentina of these, these two crops. Um, and for instance, Pierce, uh, Argentina is the third most, most important exporter of this product. So br uh, building uh, resilience structures in this kind of very localized, area, uh, localized areas is a key challenge, uh, for instance, in this case from Argentina, but also uh, globally. And also, let me bring another example in this, in this case from the US. Uh, not only from the US, but example is from the US. Um, that cities are moving from being consumers of food 
to being producers of food. Um, for instance, of course, we all know about urban agriculture as a major trend, but I would like to differentiate between two kinds of urban agriculture uh, strategies or, 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 or trends. And the first one is a, like a very, uh, let's say, traditional urban agri agriculture and, and that is settled in, in urban small plots of land uh, with a very low level of productivity uh, that is mostly focused on, I mean, of, of course they produce an amount of fruits and vegetables, there is, but it's mostly focused on an aesthetic or symbolic or recreational or educational purpose. But at the same time, we are having like very big farms, indoor and, and hydroponic farms uh, that are very productive. Uh, and for instance, there, are, there, there is one company that, is, that has two big facilities in New, New Jersey uh, that with more than 1,000 square meters of facilities with 10 floors of uh, hydroponic farms, they are growing vegetables and selling salads in, in, the, in the area. So, of course, this, this kind of urban agriculture uh, uh, a farm is, is bringing a more important uh, uh, production to the cities. But still, I believe that these kind of uh, strategies are not going to, uh, to feed a, a very large amount of, of, the, of, the, of the food that we need in the cities. And the last example um, regarding this is also in, in, in the area of New York City. Um, for instance, uh, the government of, of, of New York City is investing in creating food companies in, in the area, in New York City, uh, to, to bring quality shops to the area, so, and also to promote the label uh, made in New York City. So this is a very strange thing, I believe, uh, because there are, I mean, we never thought that we were going to have <laughs> food with a stamp that says New, made in New York City, right? So this is, this is the, the, the city of, of, of New York is bringing uh, this trend of this concern of consumers regarding the origin of the food, the ingredients of the food, and some of the, the, the things that my colleague was mentioning before. Uh, the New York City government is bringing these concerns to the city to, to build a, a more, um, to, 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 to improve the, the economic activity of the city, but also to, to, to to close the gap between the, 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 the consumers and, and the food suppliers. So these are two examples that I have in my mind. Fantastic. I think, you know, when Mike said there's definitely more urbanization, you know, shopping bags are full of fresher produce, it's good to know that cities can do that too. But for the longer haul, I think, you know, it's going to have to be a mix of, of rural traditional yeah. farming and then, of course, urban farming. Um, I owe it to the audience to have a bit more time for questions. So I think I'm going to bring you in now and, you know, let's have our hands up and same drill. Yes, sir. We didn't get to call you the first time around earlier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is uh, Serhan Suzer. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Turkish uh, Food Banking Association. And um, <clears throat> my question is uh, to anyone who whoever wants to answer. Uh, speaking of uh, you know vertical farming, uh, part of advanced greenhouse technologies you just mentioned, uh, and um, also distributed generation models. Um, so where you produce and consume at the site. Uh, what do you think these technologies and models will have an impact on food banking? I, Can I go? I guess we're looking at you now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I believe it's going to have an impact, of course. Um, regarding the pool, for instance, uh, I mean, the, the leading actor of the food supply chain uh, is changing and will continue changing, in my opinion. Uh, as I said, I don't believe that the, 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 the production of, of food in urban areas, even though it's urban agriculture or, or other kind of food production, I don't think it's going to have a major impact on the amount of food. So, in my opinion, I mean, you, 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 I think you need to be aware of, of this trend for me is, is not going to change dramatically how, how we consume food now. Uh, but at the same time, I think that logistic operators are emerging like 
as a leading actor uh, of this of the supply of food. So I think it's uh, for the food banks is maybe the, um, a new actor to get in touch with. Does anyone want to carry any thoughts? All right, does that answer your question? A little bit. All right. <laughs> Other questions then? Yes. Long way again. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, and congratulations to all these presentations. I am learning a lot. My name is Blandine. I'm coming from Madagascar, and I work with a World Food Program. Uh, I do not have any background concerning regarding a food banking, but um, we are trying to implement a pilot experience in Madagascar. And in the food system process, you did not mention the processing aspect, but I think it's very important. In Madagascar, uh, we are in a situation of food insecurity and because of droughts. And the main products that resist to a drought are cassava and pot sweet potatoes. When uh, we are the harvest time, there are plenty, plenty, plenty with a lot of loss. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we are speaking about food insecurity, so there is a paradox. So I, I'm wondering, is it possible to uh, collect this S -S -S -A surplus production and process with the system of food banking and then serve it at the right time? Mm -hmm. That is my <laughs> concern. Thank you. That would be ideal, but does anyone want to respond to that, Carrie? Any thoughts? Uh, you know, I think this is just one great example of here we have assets and we have needs within the community and how do you bring those together? And I think that's a great opening. It's a great opening question to be able to say, here's another path and here's another avenue. I think you bring up some great points within that processing infrastructure and being able to have the capacity to do that. Um, one of the challenges within that that we've seen overall is that we, we end up trying to build it for that particular scenario. Um, and that scenario exists for that season or that particular moment in time and thinking about that capacity and how that becomes year round or how that gets shared in, in a broader community setting as a way to drive efficiency within that. Um, I think you have the start of a really great conversation to be able to say who are all of the actors here? How do you bring in the supply chain to be able to get some of the economic value going within that system? Where there is surplus within it? How we make sure that we're capturing it and keeping it as as, as long as possible within the value chain. So um, I hope that's something that you continue to pursue because it sounds like a really positive program. And I think part of the answers are, lie between Maria's uh, sharing earlier with how Reagro has worked, um, you know, bringing the food bank straight to the farmer so that the surplus is not wasted, or a little bit of what Claire shared as well in terms of just empowering that whole, maybe we change the way we look at policy, so the potato example for, for instance. Other questions? There was a hand at the back that I missed earlier on. No, we're shy now. Yes, thank you. Right in the middle here. Good morning, everybody. I am Federico, uh, the chairman of uh, Mexican Food Banks. Uh, I wanted to, in Mexico, we have a when we started food banking, we say, we say we are a bridge between abundance and lack of re resources. And uh, we have talked about a lot about efficiency and logistics and everything. And uh, there is a reality in the world about inequality. And uh, the enterprises, the businesses are always thinking in, in in uh, profits and and making more efficiency and every, everything, uh, and food banking it's not well known around the world uh, of uh, what we do and what are our impact on what on our communities, and uh, we have to be more visible for the society and the role that we uh, are doing. In, in, in 
transferring value and resources to the, to the needy. And uh, what would be your recommendation on how to uh, sell our costs better to, to, the, to the business community uh, in terms of, of the value that we, that we do? Because I was talking to Christopher this morning and I was as the, the CEO of Canada Food Banks and the countries are so different situations we, are this, we, we have food banks the same thing. The lack of food, lack of resources to invest and to serve more people. So what would be your recommendation on how to be more visible, more conscious, social responsibility, but not in a cosmetic ways, because many companies talk about social responsibility, but their actions are so, so low, so insufficient, uh, what would be your recommendation for, for, for the, the food bankers of the world in your, in your experience and your knowledge and representing such important companies as Walmart and many others that are here? I think Carrie and David, this is a little bit on both of you. The, if the redistribution is a viable option, then certainly there has to be a business case to kind of raise the profile of food banks. and. I guess either of you, if you want to take it. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly in developing the guidance we developed at the Food and Drink Europe level, we, we did obviously argue and, and make the case quite strongly to the members um, that obviously the, there's a number of advantages to going down the redistribution route. And obviously you're preventing waste, you're helping to tackle food poverty, you're, you're, you're providing help to the local community, making that connection. Um, and... Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, obviously these are food businesses. Um, they're there to sell food through the normal channels uh, into the retail environment and onto consumers. So, um, but you know, the, there are there are a range, you know, of of differences in terms of where organisations are at the moment. I mean, some have recognised very early on the the, the, the social responsibility of, of engaging in this way, and, and some actively seek to donate a percentage of their of their output to 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 the community. Um, an example would be an organization like Kellogg's, for example, who have an active policy of, of distributing food, regardless of whether it's surplus or not. Um, others are, are not in that place at the moment. But at, at, the, at the end of the day, um, you know, companies are there to, to you know, to, to, to if you like, um, create, um, you know, to, to, to invest and, and create jobs and such in their communities as well, and, and to sell products through normal channels. Um, I, I did touch upon how we could try and make things a little bit easier for the business community in, in my earlier remarks. I think if we can find a way of trying to, if I can put it like this, sort of professionalise the um, food donation community a little bit in terms of it, they appear less fragmented to the industry and are, are easier and, and more efficient um, in terms of transactional dealings and such, um, you know, to, to have a common way of working, common terminology, uh, how they approach this and, and to provide some coalescence perhaps around some sort of common standard, although I realise that needs to be reasonably light touch uh, in this kind of setting. But um, uh, I think those are sort of things that could help the business community because, um, as I said, time is of the essence. And if you've got to use up a lot of resources trying to find the right partner and it's not easy to do, um, then obviously that, that is obviously potentially a barrier that works against us all. Um, and, and maybe technology has that kind of solution there, perhaps in terms of some sort of platform, uh, perhaps building on the model that Tesco developed with Fair Share in the UK, that we can more rapidly identify food um, partners, if you like, that we can donate surplus to. But, uh, Thanks, David. I'm going to give Mike a bit of airtime, Carrie, mm -hmm. before I turn Please. to you again. So. I'd just like to pick up on that gentleman's observation because the challenge for the industry is to bring the production and distribution a lot closer to the end consumer, mm. which means two things, making the whole supply chain more efficient and secondly, adapting the models, which are under threat, to these emerging consumer trends. I think the good news is, if you look across the global landscape, there's a lot of fantastic best practice by global food brands, many of which are represented here today, who do live and breathe sustainability. 
and are actively taking a leadership role. Um, these big brands set the agenda. They set the agenda with the retailers and also with the end consumer. And set from the retailer point of view, uh, distribution and retailing is driving down the cost of food and drink through scale and through technology, but the lower hanging fruit of probably being achieved. So to link those two things together, how do you get the product that's available and to make it part of the day-to-day -day business model? Retailers need to do something different, and big global brands, many of which are under threat from challenger brands or private label, but our set of agenda, there's a natural alignment of those needs, which I think is a very positive position to be in. Absolutely. Carrie? The, the only thing is I, I would add to it, you know, I think our, our company philosophy has been one around shared value, that you know, for, it's not just about efficiency, but actually if we're not creating community resilience, if we're not doing things in ways that actually address sustainability in a supply chain, if we're not thinking about economic opportunity and mobility, um, we won't be a business in the long term um, because we actually need those things to be strong in order for business to continue to grow and thrive and respond in that kind of environment. But I think there's two factors that for companies that don't necessarily have that philosophy are starting to drive some of that thinking and action. And, and you really mentioned and, and touched on both of them. One is consumers are asking for it um, and having more transparency and so to the extent that you can position food banks as a way to help drive that message and help deliver that that's a, it's a real asset and I think the second is that investors are asking for it so you mentioned environmental social and governance these are scorecards that companies are increasingly being asked to report and talk about what they're doing in real and transparent ways and so as that community starts to add an increased pressure and increased push for these things to become real, even uh, businesses that may not have had it in their mindset um, have an additional incentive to start to move along that spectrum. Joaquin, well, you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I want to add that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I believe that the, 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 key, uh, the, key, the key issue is governance. So I believe that food banks, as you said, and we were discussing about governance yesterday, uh, food banks need to be part of the discussion, the big discussions, uh, be part of the discussion of the food system, not only of the, on the food banks. And for instance, yesterday the FAO representative invited uh, the food banks to join the, uh, the CEFS, the, the Council for Food Security on the, at FAO. So I think that you should be part of the discussion at the global and the national scale, but in the, in the, in the, in the big picture of the food system, not only food banks. It's a great note to end on. I think have a seat on the table and really collaborate. Um, and speaking on sitting around the table, we have been doing that a fair bit. So I'm <laughs> conscious that we all need a bit of a leg stretch. I do too. Um, but over the last couple of panels, we've heard roughly the same messages, but really, you know, a call to action. So collaboration is key. Um, I think collaboration, but fostering the relationships and harnessing the relationships is one big takeaway. Um, the use of technology, again, only as a tool, um, but everything hinges on the way you use it, the way people use it, and the way people connect. I think that is a, a thread of messages from yesterday and today. I love the whole, the customer is ready, um, and the customer wants to get engaged. We'd like to see what that really looks like, um, whether you're as a food bank wanting to connect directly to the customer, but also for retailers and manufacturers to have a look at who are we really serving in the first place? Because that is part of finding out how we can do more efficiently what it is that we do. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the first two panels. Please join me in thanking the four experts on this room. And that's it, coffee. And I'm sure you have more questions, so let's just take them to coffee. Thank you very much. Okay, just quickly, just to reiterate the thanks to all eight of the panelists who were fantastic, and to our wonderful moderator, Patricia, who's been out there for two hours nonstop, so thank you. So there will be a coffee break now for 30 minutes, and then everybody back in here at 11 o'clock to start again. Thank you.